Yes, they are. Okay. I think if you can if you can try and speak a little bit louder, um, I'm not sure if it's just my side getting old just and deaf. Okay, is that fine? All right. Thank you. Go for it. Okay, sure. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks again for joining today's talk. Today, I'm going to be speaking about applying data science tools in geosciences because I do have quite an interest in seeing how we can use these tools and integrate them in a geoscientific background. So essentially what I want to cover is exploring what data science is because you may have noticed within the past couple of years, there's been an increase in the interest of data science and how to use data more meaningfully. And so I'm going to start off by exploring that and then shift on to how we can apply data science to our geoscientific practices. So firstly, in terms of what exactly is data science, essentially it's in the name, the science of the data. And what that involves is you want to analyze your data and extract as much value as you can from your data so that you can make better informed decisions. And the field of data science is essentially an interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, whichever one you prefer, um, study where it integrates concepts and the foundations are rooted in mathematics and statistics and we're seeing the integration of artificial intelligence. From this, we then can apply it to various different fields. So in our case, interested in the geosciences field, but can also be applied to medical industry, biological industry, et cetera. And in my case, I have quite an interest in seeing how my geological background can be um, adapted to data science. So just to give you a background of um, my career and academic profession, I completed my Masters in Economic Geology from BITS in 2022, and that was the beginning of me entering into this world of data science, mainly because of my research project where I did a machine learning study on mineral production forecasting. And from that starting point, this is how it's eventually led me to this point of having this presentation with you. All right, so in data science, there tends to be a certain package of processes and workflows that you follow to move from your initial stage where you have your data and you want to extract some sort of insight from it up until the point where you want to deploy that um, data. So basically how you visualize it and you communicate your data. The initial stages um, involve different types of analyses. So Firstly, you have your descriptive analyses, and here you want to understand how the data that you have from your past or current environment um, is distributed and how you can then display that in a visual sense. So this normally involves your basic st statistical tools, so just knowing what your measures of central tendency are, understanding your interquartiles, your Q1, your Q3, understanding your standard deviations and um, your root square means. So in this case, once you have that understanding of your general distribution, you can also then depict that in a visual um, manner. Secondly, if you move a step up, you go into your diagnostic analyses, and this is just the level up in the amount of depth in your data analysis. So now you have a broad overview of your data, and now you want to understand the reason behind specific trends that you might start noticing at um, onset. So here we want to uncover the patterns that we see. It's mainly done through data mining, which is essentially digging for more data, as well as drill down tools where you start analyzing your data at a high um, level overview and then you increase the resolution in which you are analyzing your data. So basically going from your big picture all the way to your small picture. And then lastly you have your predictive analysis. So this is where now you have an understanding of your data outside of just your basic level understanding. And now you start, you're wanting to start to make inferences about the future. 
So you want to understand how does the data you have from currently and your past um, environment, how would that affect your predictions? And an important factor is this, in this is that you want your predictions and inferences to be of high accuracy. So this is where we start seeing the um, methods such as your machine learning and your forecasting, which are these predictive modeling tools. And what that essentially is, um, is you give your computer a set data, it analyzes that, it picks up on the trends, and from that it then predicts or infers what may happen dependent on your project. All right, so now into the actual workflows of data science. So as I mentioned, there tends to be quite standardized forms of workflows and processes, but what's important to note is that it's not a linear um, process where you go straight from your problem identification all the way up to your deployment in that linear manner. It tends to be quite a reiterative um, process. So you would eventually start off with your data collection. And in our sense, from a geoscientific um, viewpoint, you would get these from your geological surveys that countries tend to publish. You can get company data, you can get data from your councils if you're interested in satellite imagery data, as an example. So once you have your data, you then have to go into some sort of preparation for it. And this may include data cleaning. And here you just want to check for missing values and what, what those missing values may um, infer. You then want to make sure that the actual labeling of your data set is correct and that it can be fed into a machine learning model. Um, you want to make sure that in some cases you identify what your predictor and label data is and this will differ depending on the machine learning model that you're working on and I'll go through the differences between those two. So once you have that step, you then can shift into your exploratory data analysis stage and this is where those different types of analyses come through because here it's just a preliminary understanding of the data as I said through your statistics and then you'd be able to visualize it um, in quite a basic form at this stage. Between your data EDA and your model training you also can have your pre-processing steps or your feature engineering where you find that the data that you have, you might have to come up with new features. You might have to join some new features. You might have to transform some features in order to have features that are um, useful for the machine learning model. So as I mentioned, it's reiterative. So you can go from your data collection and your EDA and then all of this feature engineering, or you go your data collection maybe already you can start with your feature engineering but then you want to go back and then explore your data again so that's how you can shift between these two phases and then the model training phase is essentially the main phase of your machine learning and this is where you train your models and I remember in the beginning of learning about machine learning, it was quite abstract in what exactly is meant by training your models, like what does that actually mean? The basic concept there is you have data that you would split into your trained data and your test data, and then you feed your machine learning model, your trained data, and that's where it starts to analyze the trends and the patterns. And you would then test this with the data that you split as your test data to see how accurate it is able to produce those results from the test data. So that's what's meant by your machine learning algorithms and how you are able to test your model based off of the data that you have. And then once you've trained your model, you then have to go into an evaluation stage where you're prioritizing in general, the accuracy of the model. If your models don't have high accuracy, then you know that, okay, they aren't able to take that data and turn it into something that's quite reliable or credible. So here I've just listed a few of um, these types of evaluation models. So, I mean, evaluation techniques. So you have your precision, 
you recall your F1 score, your accuracy, root mean square and confusion matrix. And just to pick one or two to explain, your precision is just the proportion of the true positives that your model is um, showing. Whereas your F1 score as an example would be the mean between your precision and your recall. So there tends to be some slight differences in what the accuracy of the model is depending on how you are actually evaluating it. But the general sense is once you train your model, you want to verify that the results that you get from your model are actually credible. And so once you go through those stages, you then end off mostly by some sort of deployment, whether it's just a basic visualization or you're going into application deployment. So depending on what your project needs, then you might just need a dashboard for that project or you want to deploy your um, project and your results on an application. So that's when you have to then go through that stage of um, the deployment. All right, so here I just wanted to highlight the different types of your machine learning algorithms. Again, just so that there's a better understanding of what's actually meant by that. And so that it's just not this abstract concept that you hear that's being applied. Um, so generally in terms of machine learning, you have three different types of, I'd say groups in terms of the different types. So you have your supervised, you have your unsupervised, and you have your reinforcement type of learning. For this presentation, I'll just focus on the supervised and the unsupervised. So when you are using supervised machine learning models, the data that you have is labeled. So you know what your X um, values are, so your features, and then you also know what your target variable is. And from there, these can be split into two types of um, algorithms. So you have your regression type and your classification. So regression you normally use if you're trying to predict like a continuous numerical value, whereas classification tends to be more of your grouped data. So just to go through the images that we have here, in terms of regression, the most simple um, form of regression would just be like a linear relationship. So that's quite a basic understanding of what regression is. You know that as you make changes to your X, then you know that your Y value would change. So it's that interplay between your independent and your dependent variables. And here they normally are predetermined by a certain uh, mathematical formula. And that's why you can then just visualize this as a graph that's shown here. And in this one, it's just showing differences. Um, so I'm just looking at um, graph E as an example, differences in micro, I mean, microplastics in the ocean or fossil fuel consumption or your pesticide use. And here I've just highlighted your different types of um, regression models. So your linear regression as an example, you also have your LISO and your ridge regression. So these are all models that you can test and then compare the evaluation to see how they perform. But of course, if you have more complex data, so if you aren't just dealing with like univariate type of data or just binary type of data, then your linear types of regression, they obviously wouldn't represent the changes in the relationships of your variables quite accurately. So that's when you would move on to more complex types of machine learning models. All right, and then in terms of classification, the end goal is that you want specific groups or categories. So based off what the model has seen, so based off the training data that you have fed, the end goal should be some sort of group. So instead of just like one, two, three, maybe it's like a yes or a no, or a um, coffee slash non-coffee, fraud or non-fraud, if you're taking it outside of geosciences. And similarly here, you have specific models that you would tend to use for these types of projects. So decision trees, your random forest, support vector machine, etc. 
And here, this is where you start seeing the complexity of your project increase, where you might have more than just two um, variables that you're dealing with. So you're starting to expand your, um, your data set and the types of variables that are included. So now moving on to unsupervised, the main difference between unsupervised and supervised is that your data isn't labeled. So the data that you're feeding into your machine learning model doesn't have your labels where you know what your X value is, et cetera. And from that, it needs to still be able to identify what these patterns are and tell you something that's meaningful from it. So a type of um, technique that's used in unsupervised modeling is your clustering um, methodology where you're organizing your data into groups. So where you start to see, well, where the machine starts to see similarities, then it tends to group those because that shows that there are um, similar values in whatever the variables are. And then from there, you have to then come with the expertise and interpret what it's actually showing you. So here, as you can see, there's just different types of clustering methods. And we just have um, the changes in this geolog I mean, geophysical survey. And you see that as it shows that on a 2D surface on your graph, then you can see that there are different clusters based off what it has picked up from the similarities in the data. Again, just listed a few models that are normally used within um, this machine learning algorithm. So here I've included a point on dimensionality reduction. And that's essentially where you have redundant variables. So you have a lot of variables, but then it starts to become too complex to show visually. And what you want to then do is you want to reduce the number of features, but then you still retain the important information within those features. So geoscientific examples of these is you want to understand the extent of mineralization. You might have quite a lot of data points and it's hard to just visualize on 2D, but if you're able to extract the key features within those data points, you're not losing on the actual insight or the relationship that your data points are showing you. Same thing with fault delineation, citation, I lose data, then it becomes more difficult to interpret um, that data. So you preserve the key features and then you are still able to see what exactly the relationship is between the data. And your techniques that you would um, incorporate into this are principal component analysis, which is essentially that um, reduction of your data where you're still retaining what is the important feature, as well as your TISNI, which is a type of um, dimensionality reduction. Again, I've also just included examples of the models that tend to be used whenever you are working with unsupervised data. All right, so now that I've explained what data science is, what the processes are, and what models tend to feature, I then wanted to link this specifically to geosciences. Um, so what I've done here is that I've just picked a few examples of publications of projects that relate to the different models. So in terms of regression, it is quite a good model for when you're dealing with um, predictions of mineral grades. So you want to understand how grade is changing throughout a specific area, and you can then use your chemical assay and geological data to start making those interpretations. So in terms of your application, you see how this is quite useful for when you do your exploration, you want to optimize your exploration, or you want to work on resource estimation where you have geochemical data and of course there are relationships between what's actually happening on the ground versus the actual elements. So this is where you can then compare those using a linear regression or if your data is more complex then you start to incorporate those uh, models that have um, higher complexity to them. 
Another example that I picked and is quite um, relevant to me currently since I'm working as a research analyst within the critical minerals industry is production forecasting. And as I mentioned, it all started in my master's year where I was looking at cobalt production, looking at its past trends and what can be inferred about future production. So this is an example where we used a type of um, regression model, so specifically a time series model, um, where we were then just checking for mineral production forecasting for market analysis understanding. And if you're interested in that, I've just included my publication on there, so you can go and read more on that specific field. I've also then included some classification, so um, detection of landslides. So this is an example where you would use your classification model because then you can classify things as low risk, high risk, or medium risk, because remember here we are grouping things into specific categories. And for you, well, for the model to make that um, inference, then it's based off of topographical data, environmental data, et cetera. And again, some models that are um, normally used for these types of projects. And here again, I've just included some types of um, geoscientific applications where regression and classification have been used. And if you're interested, you can just go read up on those and see how data science extends to all of these. So now in terms of the more unsupervised, the rock, um, the clustering techniques so or your soil rock classifications, where you use information about your geochemical or mineral composition. And here you are applying it to either your physical samples or geological samples so that you can potentially identify mineral deposits. And again, there's a list of models that you can um, attempt to see which one works best. And I just want to highlight that when you are model training, normally you don't know the exact model that's best for that specific project, you may have an idea based off the data that you have and what your end goal is. But the point of data science is also to try testing and training these models and see which one is um, gives you the best outcome. And this can be the best outcome for different reasons because you have to consider your computational um, efficiency, you have to consider the budget, how long is it gonna take for that project to run so it's not only just a technical issue, but if it's more on a business level, then you need to start incorporating those other business strategy um, considerations into your project. And then again, I've just included a seismic analysis just to show you unsupervised techniques. So using your depth, velocity, I mean, um, location and your magnitude, so you can identify seismic activity or analyze specifically earthquake data to then delineate which regions are showing tectonic um, activity or just generally increased seismic activity. And lastly, you have your remote sensing data, and this is where you tend to see that high dimensionality, and this is where a lot of the times your principal component analysis is incorporated. And an application of this is if you have a high number of spectral, uh, spectral bands that you then want to reduce. And so you can see what's happening on the land. So your um, land changes. This is where you would apply um, that model. And again, I've just offered some academic studies that can help you expand your knowledge on that. All right, so just to finish off, I just wanted to add in this toolkit, which I've said is a data science toolkit, but I think it's in vain where you are analyzing data. And this is more from my experience and um, through working on projects, what I've come across. So my introduction to and data science, et cetera, was through Python programming. There are a number of uh, programming languages, but Python tends to be the entry level. R is also a good one to start off with. And through Python, you then have specific packages that you can use when you want 
visualize your data with its full building the actual machine learning model with its full evaluating it. So I've just included, included some of this here. And then another tool that I think is quite important, especially with the growth of um, geo database management is SQL. I think SQL is quite important to learn because as a geo database geologist, for example, at a mine, this is where you want to see how can you best store the data that you have. So SQL is quite an important um, tool to know because then you can start linking different types of data sets. And then for your machine learning frameworks, I've just included the ones that um, would use using uh, Python, so TensorFlow, Keras, PyTorch, etc. And these are normally used when you're doing your actual model building, when you're training, and when you're deploying. So basically, the far end of the project. And then in terms of visualization, there's a whole spectrum of visualization techniques. So anything from your Microsoft Power BI, which is quite um, useful for interactive data. And if you just want to see specific data in, an, um, in a more visual way that's not static, then that's quite useful. Tableau does the same thing. So in terms of data visualization, Power BI and Tableau are quite similar. And then Matplotlib and Seaborn are those that you can then use your programming language um, to visualize um, your insights essentially. So doing your plotting, your visualizations and using those graphs. And as you can see, it's mostly data science focused because I feel as though if you're going into any sort of analyses, these are a good starting point. And for geoscientists specifically, I've just included the GIS because now you have plugins for um, programming language in there. And recently, something I saw that was quite um, cool to see was using an AI vectorizer. So instead of having to click, 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 you can actually use the AI vectorizer and then obviously just do a quality control to see how that um, performs. So yeah, that's my presentation today. And if you have any questions, you can ask. Thank you. Thanks so much, Nzapata. We really, really appreciate that, all the work that you put into this. Um, if there are any questions, please raise your hand and let us know if you'd like to ask. You can alternatively post your question in the chat. We'll give it a minute or so. There's a question from Lungile. Go for it. Hi, Ndabate. That was a very good presentation. Um, I just have one question. Um, do you think from a geosciences perspective, what limitations could we possibly face using data sciences? Um, I think the main, one of the main issues is the fact that geosciences is a very heterogeneous study in that the Earth system is a heterogeneous system. So once you start having a system where you don't have conformity, then it becomes harder to apply um, these data science tools. So as a starting point where you have sparse data, as an example, it's much harder to see what relationships um, may go into that. So you find that your projects may then take longer for you to get to your end goal or essentially it may cost more. So that's one limitation. Um, I think another limitation is that because Within the field of geosciences, there are so many sub-disciplines. Data integration may be difficult in that if you have geophysical data, geochemical data, geomorphological data, and, 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 and you want to have a project that incorporates all of those um, disciplines, then it starts to become more difficult to make sure that the formatting of the different types of data can be incorporated into a machine learning model. So in terms of technicality, I think those are the limitations. But outside of technicality, I just think skills might be a limitation. It currently is um, if you consider how much data science is integrated into a geology curriculum, it's not as extensive and it's only starting to build out. So I think that's where we have to do more work and making sure that the other disciplines as well are being integrated within this field. 
Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Right. Thanks a lot for your question, Mbile, and thanks for your answers. Um, Paul, uh, Paulus has a has his hand up. Also, go for it. How's it going? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Good. Thanks. Um, it's hard to hear. Um, very good presentation. So, just have a question. Um, do you, or maybe it's more like um, what exactly does a machine learning algorithm look like? What is it like? An equation, a statistical thing? Yeah. Is it in a software? Yeah. Or what exactly is it? Yes, exactly. So it's basically to an equation. So you would be working in a notebook, which is basically an application where you code in. And it's literally just text. It looks very complex when you're looking at it. I remember the first time I had to learn about the theory of machine learning. It's kind of if you if you're learning algebra the first time and you're just seeing it put together. It's basically that it's this equals that, but it has a specific meaning. And periods versus commas may also um, end up in your code not running. So it's very, it's very pedantic in that sense that it's a very complex formula um, in terms of how you code. Okay. So how do you, yeah. how 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 easy is it for someone who's never like done that to just get into the field and try to, you know, do yeah. some of this um, work? The the learning curve is quite steep. So for me, didn't really do the physics um, in uni. So like didn't major in physics. So that's where I found that people who do that tend to have a better understanding of programming as a whole because those are included in their curriculum. But I had to learn specifically for my thesis and masters. So it was quite hard. I think it's probably one of the most difficult things I've had to learn, if I'm being quite honest. But right now we're in a time where there are so many tools that you can use to progressively learn because it's very overwhelming to just wake up and be like, okay, I'm going to go straight into this. You really have to learn the basics and build your way up. And yes, it takes time. It takes effort. But once you have those tools, you find that it's quite useful in many different fields. And that's why I ventured out into, you know, upskilling myself within data science. So even though it's hard, I don't think people should be discouraged to trying it and seeing how it might help. Yeah, the reason I'm asking is because you and I were in the same class and none of yes. these things, um, <laughs> you know, this was taught in there up until we left. So yeah, exactly. I wonder how is it if you were to start um, like in the, after doing all of your degrees and you have to start a new field. And I think it's adjust. doable. Yeah, it's doable. It's not easy, but it's not impossible. Okay. Well, nice yeah. presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. There's one last question from Trisha, and then we'll move on to our next um, presentation. Sure. Um, hi, Ntabatse. Thanks for the presentation. It was really well presented and you spoke really well. So it was a pleasure listening to you. It was very interesting Thank listening you. to you. Um, my question is, often when you present machine learning results, especially yeah. to um, geologists, there's a, a view that machine learning is kind of a black box and they don't trust it because they don't mm -hmm. understand what it's doing. So what would like? how would you communicate sort of machine learning results in a way that um, sort of gives it's people meaningful. confidence that the results make sense and it's not some kind of magic trick that yeah. predicts results that don't actually um, correlate to geology. Um, I think that's where visualization becomes quite important because it's the typical example of garbage in, garbage out. If you're gonna start off with data that's not reliable, but you can expect a reliable outcome, then of course there's going to be an issue there. But then that's where you need to go into visualization and ask yourself, what is the best way to show what I'm actually trying to understand? I think once people see the correlation between, oh, this is my end goal and this is how I'm seeing it visually, then they are less apprehensive to question the data. I think the issue starts coming about where you find that the data inputted 
was not reliable to start off with, which is a common problem in data science. And of course, the model that it's going to show you at the end or the result that it's going to show you is going to be very questionable. So building confidence, I would say starting off with your actual data, making sure that you are dealing with credible data. And so you know that when you get to your visualization, you have more confidence in that that's how the machine has correlated the two. But then, as you saw on my slide, there are those um, evaluation matrix. So it shows in terms of a percentage value of some sort, how accurate. And sometimes you find that your model is 50% accurate and that's where you have to go back and see what exactly is going wrong. It's just not able to give me the results I'm expecting and that's a confrontation that you'd have to meet and not just try and run with it. 